I think there's a couple of things that people really connect it with. I think one of one of the things is is that the main uh, Poppy, the one of the main characters, um, I have I have her written as pretty much like an average woman that you would see. She is what they would consider plus size in America. Uh, she is she's at she's not you know whenever you would look at I mean still hell to this day you look at anything on TV it's like I always would make this comment that even the damn commercials always has like this extremely thin beautiful wife talking about bounty and then it doesn't matter about the guy <laughs> they could be the most like n- you know normal like everyday looking guy but that woman has to always almost look a certain way. And so I think that was one thing that people were able to see Poppy, see themselves in Poppy. And keep in mind, I am nowhere near the first person to do that. Um, Poppy also has facial scars. And so I think, again, that spoke to people who didn't feel perfect, right? Because you're being throughout the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, bombarded with these different versions of what's standard of beauty but all those standards of beauty had this flawless finish. And especially as we get into this era, right, with the filters on everything. So it's like you're now seeing somebody who is desired, even though she's not perfect, but also she was she's capable of defending herself. She can fight. And so they were able to see that. I think that was a draw. I think also, you know, there was a period of time where, again, it's not like vampires have ever gone away in fiction. It's that they, they're they always there. You can always find them. You can always find books written with them in them. But there's moments of where people are just either A, burned out on them, or like something else becomes popular. And I think I just, once again, struck at a time where it's almost like no one had no one had read a vampire book. And it's like, guys, that's impossible. <laughs> like, you know, there's a million of them. But it just wasn't what was trending at that time. And so it was new to a lot of people. Or what's the right word for it? Not new. It was it was new in an old way, right? In a familiar way that was like, oh, man, I remember reading other vampire books. And I think that is also what got people. The concept was I was... So as the, the Blood and Ash series, like my first book is kind of like fantasy, what I call, and, I, and I'm talking about myself when I say this, fantasy for dummies. It's like anybody, if you're not like... Because fantasy reading can be overwhelming. Like you, like you can't understand the names. You don't know anything about the world. It's a lot. And so with from Blood and Ash, you know, I kept it very much like the plot was just this book. And I was hinting, you know putting the little seeds for the larger, you know, plot. But as I progressed in the story and I had to start explaining the background of how this world got to where it was and there were, you know, different gods and at a time, like, you know, bringing in again, I'm always influenced by Greek mythology and that type of, you know, setup. I was having to explain that in the book, but also understand it. And for me to have understand, uh, understood like how I had to write it. So I was writing like these little tiny, like, you know, just a couple pages here and there, just so I can understand what the hell I'm supposed to be making up here. And that's kind of what, uh, and then it kind of struck me. It's like, why don't I just write the story? (laughs) You know, like, because it is in my mind, it was an interesting story because you learn that who they believe were, you know, there was a bunch of basically it was unraveling all these lies um, and being able to show that, uh, you know, became an interest to me. And so that's actually how the idea started was from me trying to understand the past myself and being like, because again, when you're writing fantasy, yeah, you're making up a lot of stuff, but you got to understand it <laughs> to sell it. Basically born of blood and ash is going to be the final book in the flesh and fire series, which is the prequel. That's the final book that shows exactly how you ended up in the world of the blood and ash. And there's, there's prophecies, there's, you know, these these hidden kind of agendas and you actually see what created it the third book in that series a fire in the flesh and that's where again you begin to start seeing all these chess pieces kind of dropping into place and it sets up for the the final books in the blood and ash series with the war two queens it again is is a point where like from the second book 
A Kingdom of Flesh and Fire, and the third, The Crown of Gilded Bones. They were building up to the War of Two Queens, and which is exactly what it says in the title. It's these two, and I, I don't want to get too, I almost dropped a huge spoiler on that, but um, it's it's a War of Two Queens. And so it's building up to that moment where you see these, not only these two queens go toe to toe, but these two kingdoms um, go at it. And it, it, so there is a lot of fighting. There's a lot of battles. Um, you start to see things that have been hidden, hinted at from book one, from Blood and Ash, um, start to happen. Uh, so that, that book is a major t- turning point because you have that, you have a war, but you have the beginnings of a war because I always feel like the first war is never the actual one that counts at the end of the day. It's the one that comes after it. And, you know, there's always people behind somebody kind of controlling what's happening. And so that's, it's so it's it's a major like pivot book. It's a major where it's like you pull the veil up and then there is the actual villains. You're now starting to see who was controlling this the whole time. So I feel like in, in stories, you have your minor villains, right? That they're going to be fleshed out to a point, but they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're there to die basically eventually in the story. Right. But with the, with the, the bigger villains, I always approach them with everybody believes that they are the hero in their own story the villain never thinks of themselves as the villain. Very few do. They think of themselves as the hero. They believe 100% they are on the right side of history. So when I write them, I try to come at it from that perspective of why do they think, because because to us, right? You're like, how do you think you're, what do you do it? And like, how do you think that's normal? That's not right. But unfortunately that the real history can be proven time and time again that people are capable of doing horrendous things if they believe that they are right and they're fighting for the greater good. And so it comes from, I come in from that angle. So you do find yourself sometimes relating to them. You may never like them, but you start to see pieces of who they must have been before they started down this world, this road. Um, in the soul of Ash and Blood, yes, you 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 see you you see a little bit of that. That book is kind of different. I mean, it's different because it's also a retelling. It, it it's a retelling of the first book through a different point of view, while it oh. also moves this. Yeah, is while it moves the story along. What, so uh, I'm interrupting you. What inspired you to do that? That's unique. Um. So uh, there, whenever you tell a story, especially in certain genres where it's in one POV. Readers really always want to see the other POV. They want to see what the other, what was, what was he really thinking about? What was she really thinking about? And so that's kind of where the idea came in, but I didn't want to do a straight POV flip of the first book because while that would be the easiest thing to do, it's not very exciting because it's like, I already wrote this. I don't want to write it again for a second time. Um, So that's where I kind of came up with the idea of how it would also move the plot forward. Uh, And and it gave me a way to work in things that people had not seen in the first book. But usually it it comes from people wanting to see what the other character was thinking. Um, So I would write bonus scenes with the other character, like flipping the POV on that scene. And that's where the idea came from the primal blood and bone that's the sixth book in that series and in that world blood means life and bone means death so it also is the primal of life and death and the primal is the primals are basically like the olymp if you had the easiest comparison you know how with greek mythology you had the olympians and then you had all the gods underneath them so um the uh the primals are basically the Olympians. They're the more, more most pro- uh, powerful of them. And then, of course, you have the Titans, which would have created them. And so they're, and my version of that are called the Ancients, and they're just reference. They're just, the, they're the ones who created the realms that long, long, long ago. Um, but yeah, so it, it's a bit of a spoiler, but it has to do with life and death, basically. <laughs> It is the last book for the characters who are who are the POV now. 
So it's, it, there is one more contracted book after that, but it will not have the same characters telling the story. Um, and you know, that, that book is, that, that book is a scary book for me because it, you know, in a way it is ending one part of that story. And the book after that, you know, will either be the, 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 the epilogue in a way featuring somebody else, or it will be the, you know, a turning point in that world. It's not a huge spoiler, but some people would be, it's one of my favorite parts about this book. And I've been dying to talk to, to say it, um, but the title is basically the ruin of the world that you take, you, you start in. And throughout the book, like there's going to be, as you're reading it, you're going to start recognizing something about this fantasy world that you might think, wait a minute, why, why does that one building look that way? You know, and that place that they're calling a temple looks an awful lot like a church, like that we would recognize in our world. And so you end up being revealed throughout the book that there are these beings that are kind of, they're called highborns in this world. Or, and they're basically celestial. People think of them as celestial beings. And you learn that they have always been there and they've just been called many things throughout history. They've been called gods. They've been called fae. They've been called demons. They've been called aliens. They've always been there. And the, the, the title comes in because you learn that the world is the world that we once lived in. And it's the modern world. And through certain events that are spoilery, but also due to deforestation, <laughs> these beings who went to ground, we woke them. And they woke up and said, well, I'm done with this. <laughs> and that you end up learning that that they are they kind of destroyed the the world, the, the, the planet as we know it, as basically a calling where it's like, we need to start over. And to do so, most of you are not going to make it. And that is where the world is built. Because one thing with like dystopia, so in reality, you could technically say that it's a little dystopian, but like, you know, when you're reading dystopian or fantasy, you don't often learn, like, how did we get here? Especially when it's fantasy that you recognize that, oh, there are contemporary elements in this. And I wanted, because I, I always want to know that, right? Like, well, how did we get here? Like, what the hell happened? How did we go this bad, <laughs> like off the charts? And in my way, it was, you know, we ended up, we were part of the reason why. We pretty much brought our own destruction upon us. And even though like, you know, they're in, and they talk about in the book about the warnings that there were many warnings that you were messing where you should not have been. And I think people could probably find obviously parallels to you know global warming to even ai of warning that you're now traveling into an area that may not be but we just keep going <laughs> like you know and so that that is where the title comes in it's the ruin of that world and then the wrath that comes up from that